Right now on Morning News Now, Donald Trump denied a federal appeals court ruling the former president is not immune from prosecution in his 2020 election interference trial, setting the stage for a possible showdown in the Supreme Court. We have team coverage. Also this morning, chaos on Capitol Hill after a GOP-led effort to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas fails in the House. Plus, Jennifer Crumbly found guilty, a landmark verdict for the mother of Michigan school shooter Ethan Crumbly, now the first parent in the U.S. to ever be convicted for a mass shooting carried out by their child. I feel that this verdict is going to echo throughout every household in the country. We'll break down the verdict and what happens next. And you could call it the wet coast this morning. Californians picking up the pieces from a days long storm. Now that system is on the move. We are tracking the conditions. Weather has been a major story, of course, for several days now out west. It really has. Yes, we that. were having the same conversation hope, last week. Hope for some relief mm -hmm. uh, in the near future. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin this morning with that major legal blow for former President Trump. An appeals court rejected Mr. Trump's claim he is immune from prosecution in the federal election interference case. He's accused of committing acts while president in an effort to overturn the 2020 election, leading to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The former president, who is the front runner, for the GOP nomination, now plans to appeal that ruling to the Supreme Court. Trump responded to the court's decision on social media yesterday, calling it dangerous and saying, quote, a nation-destroying ruling like this cannot be allowed to stand. Let's begin with NBC News correspondent Bree Jackson, who joins us from Washington with more on the ruling. Bree, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Savannah. So this case is one of four criminal prosecutions Trump faces, even as he remains the GOP frontrunner. The appeals court decision now paves the way for special counsel Jack Smith to move forward with his federal election interference case against the former president. A federal appeals court rejected former President Trump's claim that he's immune from criminal prosecution related to his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election, including actions that led to the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. The ruling states, we cannot accept that the office of the presidency places its former occupants above the law for all time thereafter. Whatever protections he thinks he may have, um, because he's a former president, he doesn't have. He's a, he's a citizen Trump. Trump showing his discontent with the decision, posting online, a president of the United States must have full immunity in order to properly function and do what has to be done for the good of our country. He can seek to have this heard by the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court does not have to take it. The former president's legal team has vowed to appeal, which could cause further delays. Special counsel Jack Smith is hoping to prosecute the case this year. I think that there is you know, some gamesmanship really on both sides of playing the calendar based on the election. Tuesday's decision comes as voters weigh in in the Nevada presidential primaries and caucuses this week. I don't think he did anything wrong. I feel like every citizen of the United States needs to be held accountable to something that they did wrong. Trump's legal battles expected to play a key role in the race for the White House. And on Thursday, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments over whether former President Trump can remain on the ballot in Colorado. This after the state Supreme Court ruled that he violated Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which stops anyone who engaged in insurrection from holding elected office. Back to you. All right, Bree Jackson, thank you so much. We are now joined by NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas here on set with us. Danny, good morning. So first, let's just get you to kind of weigh in on both sides of this in your reaction here. So Trump had argued that criminal liability for former presidents will, in his words, open the floodgates for meritless and harassing prosecution. The appeals court found that risk appears to be low was the way they put it. Tell us what you thought of their decision. I thought it was a well-reasoned decision. I think a lot of folks are saying that today. But I will say that I thought there could have been more on a particular issue. And that issue is a discussion of whether or not the acts as alleged in the indictment for Donald Trump uh, fell within official acts or even the outer perimeter of his official acts. There was really not a lot of discussion about that, and I was looking for it. But I have to say this, the court didn't necessarily need to wade into that morass of whether or not Donald Trump's conduct was official acts under the uh, presidential immunity uh, because really their conclusion was that there is no such thing as absolute 
presidential immunity for a former president uh, for this particular situation. In fact, in a way, the opinion leaves open the possibility that there are all kinds of different situations in which there would be presidential immunity, even for a former president, in the case of discretionary acts, for example, political type acts. Uh, but really what they say is in this particular situation, the answer is no. So now we know the former president plans to appeal. He could go to the Supreme Court. He could also go to sort of the full federal appeals court instead of just this three judge panel. If this does go to the Supreme Court, what can we expect to see? What are their options? Here? He will not go back to the D.C. Circuit Court. He will not ask for a rehearing. He will not ask for en banc review. And en banc review just means that instead of the three on the panel that heard this, the entire court would hear it. And the reason he won't do that in all likelihood is because the mandate issued by the court or the court's order says explicitly, and this may be the most important thing the court did, more than its actual opinion, they said that he has until the 12th, but if he does ask for a rehearing, it will not stay the case. The case will go back to district court to Judge Chutkin. So instead, that leaves the only viable avenue for Trump, a, an emergency petition to the Supreme Court, because that's his only chance for a stay. And that's really the unspoken thing here. It's something that doesn't appear in the opinion or in the briefs or anything else. This is all about delay. That's the only thing the Trump team cares about. If they can delay this past the inauguration, the federal case is over. In fact, all federal cases are over. But they just can't say that in their moving papers. Uh, so that is what you're likely going to see. They'll wait until the last possible minute, which will be the 12th. Then they'll file their petition for emergency review and a request for a stay. It goes to Chief Justice Roberts only because he has jurisdictional, geographical jurisdiction for this jurisdiction. And then it's up to the court. Let's talk, Ben, about timing. You mentioned that they will delay, delay, but so that March 4th date tossed out for this trial to actually get underway. What's your best guess on when we actually see that happen? That is always the question, right? But take, consider this, and I said this for weeks and weeks. For the last few weeks, a lot of folks kept saying, well, where is the D.C. Circuit on this opinion? And I have to say, I kept thinking, well, my only basis for comparing it is normal, mortal, ordinary cases. And those cases ordinarily take a long time. And look at this opinion. There was a 52 or 57 page opinion. Uh, that is something that was deeply checked, uh, edited. They were very careful in their opinion. And that's something that's going to take more than a week to write. So all of these things, yes, I can talk about the fastest possible. And maybe you could see a trial by May if everything moves at the fastest rate. But in all likelihood, I always say for a high profile case, just add a few months. That brings us smack dab into right. the election. Mm. Danny Savalos, as always, we appreciate you. Thanks so much. Former President Trump sat out the symbolic Nevada Republican primary on Tuesday, and his top challenger, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, still came in second to no one. NBC News projects Haley has lost the Nevada contest despite not having any major challenger. The ballot permitted voters to back a specific candidate or effectively pick none of them. That option, as you can see on your screen right now, received more support than Haley. It was essentially viewed as a stand-in option for Trump. This is Haley's third straight loss to kick off the primary season, but she's vowed to stay in the race. Now, while former President Donald Trump was not on the ballot yesterday, he will compete on Thursday when Nevada Republicans will hold caucuses. Now, that is the contest that will award the state's delegates. On the Democratic side, NBC News projects that President Biden has won the Nevada primary. The win puts him one step closer to formally clinching the party's nomination, setting up a likely general election rematch in November against former President Trump. Sticking with politics, it was a shocking setback on Capitol Hill for Republicans in a dramatic moment, the months-long GOP effort to try and impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas failed in a full vote before the House of Representatives. The defeat came after Speaker Mike Johnson accused Mayorkas of allowing millions of migrants to cross into the U.S. I don't believe there's ever been a cabinet secretary who, who was so blatantly, openly, willfully, and without remorse did exactly the opposite of what the federal law requires them to do. At least three Republicans were not convinced, joining all Democrats in voting against the measure. For more, we're joined by NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. So, Julie, a vote to impeach Secretary Mayorkas was always expected to be a tight margin. But lead us through this vote, what we're hearing from those three Republicans who voted against the impeachment. 
Yeah, this was a stunning moment of defeat for Republican leadership, not only in the House, by the way, in the Senate as well, with the dismantling and failure of this border package. But in the House yesterday, man, we were watching C-SPAN. You're watching the floor live. The action was really down to the wire. Al Green, who was a Democrat, came in in a wheelchair with his hospital gown after just getting surgery and uh, voted against this measure, knocking down the Republican tallies. And in an effort to convince some of those Republicans who were a dead set against voting for this impeachment. Speaker Johnson tried to pressure them to no avail. And here's what one of them had to say on the floor earlier. What is the uh, grounds of impeachment to a point where we can expect it to be leveled against every conservative Supreme Court justice, uh, every future Republican president and cabinet member, and then the Democrats take control? That was a similar argument made by Congressman Mike Gallagher as well. He said this sets a bad precedent moving forward. Of course, a cabinet secretary has not been impeached in 150 years, guys, but it doesn't mean that this effort is over. Julie, let's talk about that bipartisan Senate border bill, which didn't last very long. It's going nowhere. President Biden is pointing the finger squarely at former President Trump and Republicans. First, I want to play some of what he said. We'll talk after. Every day between now and November, the American people are going to know but the only reason the border is not secure is Donald Trump and his MAGA Republican friends. If this border bill is indeed voted down, it's only February to President Biden's point. Is there any time before the November election to get meaningful border legislation pushed through? No, there's just no way that's going to happen. This was really a last-ditch effort by a group of bipartisan senators who worked for months to try and negotiate a product that could help make the border more secure to stem the flow of the record migrant crossings that we've been seeing. And Republicans have really said the quiet part out loud, including yesterday. I was at a press conference with Senator Ted Cruz, Rick Scott, who were bashing this deal, who said that this was a political gift, the very idea of trying to come out with a border proposal in an election year. They're all pointing to the ballot box is the only way the border crisis will be fixed. But Democrats now have something to campaign on. You heard President Biden mention some of that. They can now say that Republicans killed a border deal that they wanted, by the way, in exchange for Ukraine and other foreign aid. Uh, and they can say, after not saying much about the border, that this is something Democrats are going to prioritize. And it's Republicans to blame for the crisis not being addressed. So, Julie, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has also told Democrats he's going to force a vote today on his supplemental aid bill. Without those border provisions, what more can you tell us about that? Exactly. Schumer actually set up this possibility on Monday. He knew this could potentially happen, that Republicans who originally demanded that Ukraine and border be linked now reversing course on that position. So what's going to happen today is when Republicans, which they are expected to do, are going to block this bipartisan supplemental bill with the border provisions included at around one o'clock. Schumer is then going to go to the floor and bring up a supplemental package without the border security provisions in it, still including the Fend Off Our Fentanyl Act, which is a big bipartisan priority. That uh, unclear the fate of that policy, but of course, Ukraine aid is on the line. The House Republicans don't want Ukraine aid, so it really is a question as to how this lands. All right, Julie Serkin. Julie, thank you so much. Now let's get to that unprecedented verdict out of Michigan. A jury finding Jennifer Crumbly, the mother of a Michigan school gunman, guilty in the shooting deaths of four of her son's classmates. Crumbly was convicted yesterday on four counts of involuntary manslaughter for the deaths from a mass shooting in 2021. It's the first time in the U.S. that the parent of a convicted school shooter is being held criminally responsible for their child's deadly actions. The case against her centered on her actions and inactions before her son Ethan shot 10 students and a teacher at Oxford High School in at, at, at Oxford High School in Oxford, Michigan. Ethan was 15 at the time. We've got team coverage of this landmark verdict. We have NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa in Pontiac, Michigan, and we have NBC News legal analyst Angela Sanadella here on set with us. Thank you both for joining us. Maggie, I will start with you there. This has been an emotional trial. What do we know about how jurors arrived at this verdict. Well, Savannah, basically, they took less than two days to get to that landmark verdict, 11 hours by our count. This entire case exactly took two weeks from jury selection through the verdict. It's also worth noting among the jury, uh, many of those jurors are parents. Most of them are parents. Many of them are gun owners. And again, arriving at this verdict with a day and a half of deliberations inside that courthouse, victims' families telling me they hope this serves as a wake-up call for parents across America. 
So, Angela, let's bring you in here. What's the precedent that you think this verdict set? Do you think we're going to see more parents charged in cases like this? Yes, I do think we will across the country. I also think what this really does is it gives prosecutors a lot more confidence and it will affect plea deals because they will use this to parents and say, well, look what happened in Michigan. Look, every state has involuntary manslaughter laws. I also think, though, it's important to note that in this case, every member of that jury agreed on this. Mm. So this is not to say that they, if they are charged more frequently, it will result in convictions all the time. It's just I do think it will bolster the confidence of prosecutors. Maggie, what kind of sentence is Jennifer Crumbly facing and what happens next? Yeah, so it's 15 years uh, maximum per count. So we have four counts, possibly 60 years, although our legal analysts tell us it is rare in the state of Michigan for a sentence like this to be handed down consecutively. So again, we're looking at the maximum 60 years, but the judge uh, has discretion there. Her sentencing is set for April 9th, guys. It's also worth noting her husband's trial. Uh, they're being tried separately. His is set to begin next month on March 5th. He faces the same charges, four counts of involuntary manslaughter. And just yesterday, we got our hands on the prosecution's witness list for his trial. Trial. Every single witness called by the prosecution for Jennifer's trial is on the list for his. So while it's not a guarantee that those witnesses, of course, will be called to the stand, it's very possible, at least, that we could see a lot of the same arguments that we just heard in Jennifer Crumbly's trial kind of rehashed, for lack of a better word, for her husband's case, which is coming up, guys. So, Angela, let's talk more about the husband's trial. Do we expect we're going to see the exact same case presented? How does this case impact James Crumbly's case. Yes, well, I don't think things are looking good for him. I think, in fact, his culpability is arguably worse, given that he is the one who purchased the gun for his son in this straw man purchase. He was not supposed to do that. And according to Jennifer Crumbly's testimony, he's also the one who is in charge of storing the gun. Now, whether or not he will dispute that, we'll see. But I don't think this looks good for him. She was, in essence, trying to blame him, and she gets convicted. So does that suggest that maybe even the state's case is stronger against him? Yes, and also, when the prosecution wins a case like this, again, with that exact same witness list, their confidence is through the roof. So this next round, he better have better defense attorneys. All right. Angela and Maggie, thank you both very much for your help on this one. More showers and heavy snow ahead for the West Coast. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Angie Lastman is here in studio. She is tracking the storm's path for us. Hey, Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. We've got a couple things to talk about when it comes to the same storm system as it marches to the east. But one note, we are seeing some drier skies across parts of Southern California. It doesn't mean it's going to stay perfectly dry over the next couple of days because we, in fact, do have another batch of some wet weather working in there. But a couple of welcome breaks. We've got some snow falling in some of those higher elevations across those western mountain ranges. And that's that's what we're going to see here over the next couple of days. Still plenty of alerts in effect. We have seen them come down for places like Bakersfield and L.A. as far as the flood concerns are, con are as, far as far as the flood alerts are concerned. Notice they're still in effect for parts of San Diego and uh, the surrounding area. We've got winter alerts up and we've got wind alerts and those extend farther to the east. The system's on the move. So we've got this one that we've been watching. That's going to bring some snow across portions of the Rockies and the plains through the day today. But notice we've got another batch of, of wet weather that it works on shore for California here as we get into the later parts of your Wednesday and into your Thursday. So, yes, you might notice some dry skies for a couple of, uh, of hours today, but we've got more rain on the way. That initial system is also going to bring some snow and some rain to portions of the plains and parts of the Great Lakes here as we get through your Thursday. It'll be a little soggy of a commute for folks uh, on their way home as you uh, are out and about in that area for tomorrow afternoon and evening. Here's the, the deal as far as the additional rain that we're expecting across those really saturated grounds in California. We've got another inch, maybe inch and a half in some of the uh, more isolated areas. We'll still see another quarter of an inch, though, possible in that heavy rain. The timing, again, is going to be here as we get into the later parts of your Wednesday and into your Thursday. As far as the snow is concerned, um, really piling up across these ranges. You can see anywhere from a foot to a foot and a half in a lot of spots across parts of the Rockies. We'll see that, and that's going to make it a little difficult for travel if folks are going to be out and about here in that area over the next day or so. 
Here's the, the big picture. Look, we've still got the record warmth here uh, across parts of the Great Lakes. The middle of the country is running way warm for this time of year. 50s, 60s, even close to 70 degrees across parts of Texas. We've got sunny and kind of milder conditions taking shape across the, the southeast. But uh, as we look ahead to the weekend, it's going to be the record highs that get your attention for much of the east. We've got temperatures headed into the 50s. We've got temperatures headed into the mid-60s here as we look ahead to Friday. Still dealing with, however, the snow showers across the Rockies and those western mountain ranges as we round out our work week. Looking ahead to Saturday, we've got some heavy rain that will track across parts of the southeast and the interior northeast. We've got more snow for the Rockies. And then finally, finally, we're going to see those sunnier skies settle in for parts of the west, specifically California, which of course will have a lot of cleaning up to do. By the time we get into Sunday, we've got some stormy conditions that we'll have to track across parts of the southeast, really warm conditions across parts of the northeast. We're talking upper 50s for uh, parts of the weekend guys in the city and we're going to see still the the snow showers working across the middle of the country as we round out our weekend we can see some shorts some tank tops i think so people yeah. run even still in the cold and shorts oh, yeah. which is just <laughs> really mind blowing sometimes i see no shirts in the, yeah i like think we'll see degrees. a lot of that sunday so <laughs> <laughs> prepare yourselves angie thank you well there's much more to come here on morning news now later this hour cancer concerns the world health organization projecting an alarming 77% spike in cancer cases by 2050. What doctors want you to know. Up first after the break, a counter proposal from Hamas, including a plan to try and end the war with Israel. We're going to have the latest on talks when we come back. We're back with an update on the proposed hostage and ceasefire negotiations between Hamas leaders and mediators in Egypt and Qatar. Hamas has introduced a counter proposal this morning, including a plan to try and end the war. The offer comes as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spent the morning in high-level meetings with Israeli leaders in Tel Aviv. Blinken previously met with both Qatari and Egyptian officials to discuss the future of those hostages still being held in Gaza. He had this to say afterward. There's still a lot of work to be done, but we continue to believe that an agreement is possible and indeed essential, uh, and we will continue to work relentlessly to achieve it. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from Tel Aviv with the latest. Matt, good morning. So what more do we know about this ceasefire counterproposal from Hamas leaders? Is there a realistic option here to end the war? Yeah, well, I can tell you guys, I just spoke with an Israeli official just this morning and was told that this is unrealistic, that this is a non-starter for the Israelis, and it really looks like this brings us all the way back to square one. Now, these weren't exactly the same maximalist proposals that the Hamas had had before, but it is very close to the non-working agreement that they were trying to present earlier, which was essentially a full and final cessation of all Israeli hostilities in the Gaza Strip, the full release of, uh, of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails, and the full withdrawal of all Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip. This is a little bit more of a compromise, but not by much. This is 135 days, what Hamas is proposing, of a ceasefire by the Israelis. Uh, it involves uh, basically reconstruction of the Gaza Strip, a massive withdrawal of all Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip. And as far as the Israelis are concerned, this is just not going to work. And I've even heard that they might not even really go so far as to present this to the war cabinet. Uh, they just think it's unworkable and a non-starter. Guys. And Matt, did this counter-proposal influence Blinken's visit to Israel today, just knowing that it's even on the table? We don't know yet because we haven't heard yet from uh, Blinken's visit. It's happening basically as we speak. The intention of Blinken's visit, if you're to believe the Israelis, and I was speaking to them about this, was that he was here in order to try to ink this deal, in order to get it over the line. And that's why he was doing the shuttle diplomacy all around the region. And that's why he was visiting places, uh, who the countries that were involved in the negotiation. You see Saudi Arabia, not involved in the negotiation, but he was he's going to Qatar. He was in Egypt. And of course, he's in Israel now. So these were all parties to the negotiations that were inked out about two weeks ago in Paris. Uh, but now it looks like this is going to be disappointing for all of the parties involved, particularly the Palestinian residents of the Gaza Strip. Guys. So, Matt, there are growing concerns about Israel's push toward Rafah. That's the border crossing with Egypt. It's become a refuge mm -hmm. for an estimated one million Gazans. Is this adding pressure for all sides to try and reach some sort of ceasefire deal before Israel's anticipated assault on the region? And just how dire is the situation in Rafah? 
Well, the situation is very dire. You're seeing it on your screen right now all over the Gaza Strip. These are people who were almost entirely, the, almost the entire population of Rafah right now was displaced from elsewhere in the Gaza Strip. So these are all displaced people. We understand that they're suffering from famine, malnutrition, and disease, and that they're not getting adequate medical care or food because UNRWA now is suffering as well. There's been a lot of withdrawal of financing ever since that scandal uh, where the Israelis accused a dozen members of UNRWA of participating in the Hamas terror attacks on October 7th. We have word now that the assault on Rafah is already beginning. Uh, the Israelis had signaled that they were going to turn their guns from Khan Yunis, where they are now, in the southern part of the Gaza Strip to Rafah, which is right on the border uh, with Egypt. And this is a place where, again, this was a redoubt for all of these Palestinian civilians who had come from elsewhere. And now, and this was true before, it's truer now, there really is no safe place for Palestinian civilians to go. Guys. All right, Matt Bradley, Matt, thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Staying in the region, our NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby is the only reporter embedded with the U.S. Navy in the Red Sea where ships are being attacked by Houthi rebels. She has a closer look at how American forces are defending that vital waterway. Iranian-backed Houthi militias showing no sign of backing down, attacking two more ships in the Red Sea with six missiles causing minor damage, according to U.S. officials. After the U.S. and British military struck three dozen Houthi sites in Yemen in an effort to deter Houthi attacks on ships, the U.S. Navy tasked with defending against them. The weapon we're most concerned with is uh, ballistic missiles. Like the one that hit this ship, the Marlin Luanda, in January. How would you describe the environment out here right now? I, you know, I'd say this is it's a pretty intense environment out here. As captain of the USS Mason, Commander Justin Smith has to make a split-second decision to shoot down an incoming missile. We're talking a matter of seconds here, uh, but my decision space is, you know, Commander's decision space on whether I'm going to engage that uh, inbound threat, I have about 10 to 15 seconds of decision time. The ship's spy radar first detects the missile launch hundreds of miles away. Sailors quickly put on their fire-resistant gear as they assess what was launched. I assess as anti-ship ballistic missiles. Speed, altitude, and maneuvering. Inbound basin. And the U.S. fires its own missile to hit the incoming Houthi missile. Here in the ship's control room, they practice shooting down missiles over and over. In a rare interview, we spoke with the captain who runs Operation Prosperity Guardian, which defends against Houthi attacks. I won't beat around the bush. This is a, this is a kinetic environment. The Houthis have caused a lot of may mayhem out here. There have now been more than 40 attacks by Houthis against commercial ships and military ships in the region since mid-November. Back to you. All right, Courtney, thank you so much. Coming up, a crisis on campus. The FBI is sounding the alarm about hate crimes committed at schools. More from the new report, including the one group being targeted the most. And more proof that you are what you eat. What researchers found about the link between your diet and your immune system. That will be in our weekly checkup that's coming up next for you. Stay with us on Morning News Now. Welcome back. A recent report from the FBI shows hate crimes on school campuses are on the rise. In fact, 10% of all hate crimes in 2022 happened on school grounds. The report also revealed that the most targeted demographic of bias-motivated crimes at schools were African Americans. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro has that story. Hate crimes, often acts of violence motivated by a bias like gender, race, or religion, are now reportedly happening to more and more students in schools every year. A new FBI report revealing schools, colleges, and universities are the third most common place where reported hate crimes happen, nearly doubling from 700 in 2018 to 1,336 in 2022. I'm very surprised that it is increasing instead of decreasing. Students like Theodore Temple's son, Teddy, falling victim. The 12-year-old was stabbed in the head by a classmate last year at his Colorado Middle School, according to Denver police. He just rushes at me, and then he stabs me in my head. And then I started seeing like my blood, like it started coming down. I started screaming. The other student now charged with attempted murder and bias-motivated crime, but has not entered a plea in court. Teddy's father says that student was once a friend until he says he began calling Teddy racist slurs. It was just totally because of his race. He had every intention of killing him. In Washington state. It was a planned attack. 
Natasha Wheeler says her child, who identifies as transgender, was assaulted at their high school after creating an LGBTQ club. She believes that made them a target. Prosecutors charging one student with felony assault and a hate crime for the 2022 attack. NBC News has reached out to the prosecuting attorney for the case status, but has not heard back. The world needs to see what's happening and force change because the more people that see it, the more pressure there is to make it right. FBI statistics finding the most common bias type of reported hate crime offenses at schools was anti-black or African-American, followed by anti-Jewish and anti-LGBT. Anti-transgender hate crimes in schools increasing by 163% in the last five years, and crimes motivated by bias against disability tripling in that time. What do you think contributes to that increase? Probably the, the most important factor is social media. Social media is a huge driver of hate because haters a voice and a voice that they, they really never had. The Anti-Defamation League says it works to be proactive. We do anti-bias, anti-bullying, anti-hate work in the schools, programs which fight anti-Semitism, Holocaust education. But finds that many schools seek out help once incidents have already taken place. We certainly need to be reactive, but, but we need to be taking steps that will help us get ahead of this. Some calling on classroom lessons to extend beyond math and reading, adding chapters on tolerance and understanding. Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. Experts say hate crimes are difficult to track and often underreported because many victims fear retaliation or that they may not be believed. Now it is time for our weekly checkup. This week, the King of England was diagnosed with cancer and country singer Toby Keith died after battling stomach cancer. Well, now there's a startling new report from the WHO about the world's cancer rates. Plus a new link between what you eat and your immune system. Joining us now here in person, Dr. Kavita Patel, NBC News medical contributor and co-host of the new Slate podcast, well, now, congratulations. Thank you. That's so exciting. <laughs> and great title for that one, too, by the way. Let's talk about cancer, because the World Health Organization released a report showing the global cancer burden is growing. I mean, talk about that. What are the most yeah. common types of cancers, and what should people know about the risk? Yeah, so there's, there's good news, bad news. The bad news is that we're seeing an increase in cancers, 20 million cases in 2022, about one in five people in the world. The good news is that we're advancing in our therapies if you can get them. Only about a third of the world has access to some of these life-saving treatments and some of the medications that sometimes we take for granted. So the doctor's orders here and the leading causes in men, lung cancer, women, breast, but both are susceptible to many different kinds of cancers. So the orders here are to know your family risk factors and to talk about this with your doctor. And don't forget screenings. We have mm. so many screenings for lung, for breast, for prostate, for many of these cancers, and we're doing research to check for screening for the ones we don't have, like stomach cancer. So a lot of progress and talk about these risk factors. Absolutely. Um, one study actually that we're about to discuss is maybe something that could help decrease a certain yeah. type of cancer. This is the British Journal of Sports Medicine. They found that cardio exercise may decrease men's risk of prostate cancer. Walk us through this and exactly how much cardio we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. That's the key question here. Cardio respiratory fitness was measured in Sweden. About 57,000 men were measured over time. Didn't include black men, which I want to say is an important, for prostate cancer, an important population. Yeah. And they measured people over a period of years and at least twice and basically put them on cycles and check their VO2 max. So think about getting on like a Peloton bike and getting your heart rate up. And that's really what they looked for, kind of that increase in heart rate and getting more oxygen in. Mm. A 3% increase in your cardiorespiratory fitness translated to about a 35% relative risk reduction for wow. prostate cancer. 35%. This adds to that growing body of evidence we've talked about, about exercise being good for you and <laughs> especially in helping reduce you don't cancer. Say. <laughs> so the doctor's orders here are really to get your heart rate up. So how much, it's what you need to get kind of a sustained heart rate up. And then I like to remind people about checking for prostate cancer. We call it face up to prostate cancer. Family history, mm. age, changes in urination, and your ethnicity. Those should all be things you think about as men to think about prostate cancer screening. I think those are, people Thanks. think of working out as like, oh, I'm getting skinnier. There are The benefits, the benefits are just so just, much more. Just and, and remember, keep it simple. Just get out and move. Don't overthink right. it. Even when you say something like the increase in oxygen, you know, you're it not is. thinking about those types that. of things right. that can do so much for, right. for your body. And we talked internal. about the mental health, too, the part of the event oh. that translates. Another thing that helps is your diet. So researchers at the National <laughs> Institutes of Health are 
basically saying there's a link between vegan or keto diets and then a healthy immune system. It is the battle of all diets. Which one's better, really the plant-based vegan <laughs> or the keto the diet? Winning. Right, exactly. <laughs> they took 20 people. For two weeks, they put them through an intense vegan diet. So about all, all like actually many carbs, about 75% carbs. And then after two weeks of doing that, whatever they wanted, they went to a two-week keto diet. So flipping it and basically 10% carbs. And what they found, and they were really looking for immunity levels. And I'm going to kind of shortcut this in the, in, by describing that if you're on a vegan diet, they found that certain innate immunity levels, the front lines of defense for like a virus like COVID, mm -hmm. actually increased. So that kind of boosted that level. Okay. A keto diet boosted what we call adaptive immunity, which is some of the memory cells. So, for example, after you get COVID, getting the memory to fight future infections. Oh. So both help. But keeping your diet And they're sensible, very different, though, aren't they? They are very so different. On keto, aren't you so, eating, like, a bunch of meat and cheese? And, and a lot of fat, yeah, and low yeah. carb. But Vegans here, don't do that. Yeah, the, the doctor's <laughs> exactly orders the here. Talk, to, talk yeah. to your doctor about your diet. And think about food as a prescription. It can modify your risks for certain right. diseases. Food as a prescription. Yeah. I like yep. that. Dr. Patel, come see us in person more I'd often. I'd love to. It's so great when <laughs> you're here. You. Thanks for joining us. Coming up, a frightening forecast. Scientists pushing for a new, stronger category of hurricanes. And it's because of climate change. And game change. We're going to tell you about the major merger that could change how you watch sports. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Hurricane season may still be months away, but forecasters are already talking about changing the way they categorize hurricanes. Under the current system, the highest category, as you may know, is five, which includes all storms with winds above 157 miles per hour. However, two researchers say climate change is causing more powerful storms. So now they want to add a category six. Kim Cobb is a professor and director of the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. He joins us now to explain what all this means. Thanks so much for joining us. So let's start with the proposed changes to the current model. Why might we need a sixth category here? Well, the data are very clear now that we have had, the, of the last uh, five strongest storms in history, all of them have occurred in the last nine years. And they have, in some cases, topped out at 215 miles per hour in the case of Hurricane Patricia in 2015. We know that warming ocean temperatures have already increased the energy available to tropical cyclones. And we know that continued warming will bring uh, more threats to these highest categories of storms. So from a scientific perspective, Perspective. The trend and the data are there. We understand the physics and the models project that this trend will continue going forward. So it does make sense. So if most of the deaths and destruction to property, as we've come to learn, aren't caused by wind, uh, what are they caused by and how can this scale help better communicate a storm's power, you know, hopefully with the potential to save lives, to get people to understand what really could be coming their way no matter how far inland they are? Yeah, I mean, you're touching on a, a critically important topic about how to communicate the full spectrum of threat from these tropical cyclones. And, and that is a huge challenge. Uh, National Hurricane Center uh, just informing the public that they'll be updating some of the ways that they communicate those threats going forward. But to answer your question, it's not just the winds. And we've seen this time and time again in the last years of, of horrific headlines about the storm surge and the fact that the water is now coming from the sky in record uh, levels. So we're seeing hurricanes like Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Florence, uh, dumping record amounts of rainfall, which in and of themselves are causing uh, extreme damage. So it's really the wind, storm surge and rainfall potential that the Hurricane Center has a challenge to communicate. Would this Category 6 uh, dramatically improve the way that the public uh, sees this triple threat? Uh, probably not in isolation, but we're hoping that that new communication tool they're coming out with this summer uh, might help. But it's certainly... Uh, people just don't understand the full threat mm. of what climate change can deal up in terms of tropical cyclone strength. And perhaps this new Category 6 will provide a wake-up call to those communities under those threats uh, to take appropriate action. There is another change, and it's that cone that we all see that gives us an idea of where the hurricane mm. might go, and we're always paying attention to where it might shift. There's an update to that this year. What's changing and why? 
Well, we haven't yet seen the full uh, available uh, warning tool, uh, just a preview of it out from the National Hurricane Center. Uh, but this is trying to address the longstanding issue that the public and decision makers, including emergency responders and, and elected officials, seem to be uh, hewing to that center line of the cone of influence. And if that center line of the track doesn't go across your county or city, uh, you are more likely to disregard that warning, uh, taking into account, of course, it's the full cone. Uh, that is really what is of highest concern. But the outside the cone, you can still have devastating impacts. Uh, how to communicate this effectively to the public is a huge challenge for hurricane forecasters. And I'm sure that they'll be uh, really addressing that particular concern about that center line and the interpretation of the cone um, is really um, something that we'll see this summer. And I'm sure it will make a, uh, a big difference in how people are responding to those forecasts and threats. All right, Kim Cobb, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. Yes, we do. Thank oh, you. Thanks for having me. Now let's get to what's making financial headlines. Over 750,000 vehicles are being recalled by Honda. CNBC's Bertha Coombs has that and other money news. Bertha, good morning. Hey, Joe and Savannah. Yeah, Honda is recalling three quarter of a million vehicles in the U.S. because of a faulty sensor, which may cause the front passenger airbags to inflate when they're not supposed to in the event of a crash. The recall covers certain Honda Pilot, Accord, Civic, HRV, and Odyssey models from 2020 to 2022 model years, as well as the 2020 Fit and Civic Coupe. The Acura MDX, RDX, and TLX from those years are also affected. Dealers will replace those seat sensors at no cost, and owners will be notified uh, when to come in starting next month. Meantime, the National Transportation Safety Board says the Boeing 737 MAX jet involved in that blowout of a door panel on an Alaska Airlines flight last month was missing four critical bolts. In their preliminary report, investigators say the bolts appear to have been left off after Boeing employees performed work on the plane's fuselage shortly after it arrived at the company's factory in Washington state. The NTS report comes as most 737 MAX 9 jets that were grounded, have gone through inspections, and have resumed flying passengers. Coca-Cola, is spicing things up. The brand announcing a new flavor, Coke Spiced. It's the first permanent flavor to be introduced by the company in three years. Coke says it blends the taste of the classic soft drink with a burst of strawberry and spiced notes. The new drink will be in store starting February 19th. Well, mm. I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> Me either. Don't know till we try. I but love <clears> just <throat> a regular classic Coke. Yeah, right? Maybe it's my soda of choice. I'm thinking it's going to be like a spicy margarita or something. But, but I feel like, you're, like you would like, way. do you like cherry Ooh. Coke? Yes. I that would be Coke. good. So yeah. this is like raspberry. Might, yeah. might be for you. Give it a shot. All right. Bertha, thank you. <laughs> thank That's you so funny. much. I, I'm a Diet Coke person. No. So. Oh. <laughs> mm. Not, not I, <laughs> for the things. Now let's get to a blockbuster announcement that could shake up the way you watch sports. ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery just announced they are teaming up to launch a joint sports streaming service this fall. Now the platform doesn't have a name or a price yet, but the companies say it's going to include all the broadcasts and cable networks owned by Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery that carry sports. Brian Stelter joins us now. He is a special correspondent for Vanity Fair, also the author of Hoax and Network of Lies. Brian, thank you so much for joining us this morning. So what do we know Thanks. about this streaming platform so far and what it's going to offer? Yeah, this is really the age of experimentation in cable and streaming and television. And this joint venture is the latest example. Everything's on the table. There are lots of options. These companies, these media giants, are trying to come up with new ways to bundle and unbundle and rebundle. And, and that's why I say it's the age of experimentation. This is one giant experiment to, to put ESPN and Fox's sports uh, brands and to put Warner Brothers Discovery's sports assets all in a bundle, but not in an exclusive way. You will still be able to access these games and these channels uh, in other ways through a traditional cable subscription, uh, through some streaming options. But what these companies are doing is that they're trying to uh, band together and figure out a way to serve hardcore sports fans. You know, that, that there's an audience of tens of millions of Americans 
who really, all they really truly want at the end of the day, they want basketball, they want football, they want soccer, they want hockey. And this is the kind of bundle that would really appeal to them. So we've seen more of this recently. You got Amazon with football on Thursday nights. We had the Peacock game a couple weeks ago. So how could this potentially reshape sports and the sports streaming yeah. landscape? Is this a sign that people are turning away from traditional cable to watch mm. sports? Or is it just a sign that we just have more cord cutters out there? I think it's a sign that instead of having one way to watch TV, if you think back 10, 20 years ago, there was really just one way to watch TV, right? Now, there's a dozen ways. There's a dozen ways to subscribe, and there's going to be more and more and more. It feels like every year we hear about even more experiments. Look at Apple Vision Pro, which is out this month, and imagine watching a game and feeling like you're actually in the arena. We're going to see more and more of these experiments, but these it's coming in part because these leagues, these sports leagues, these teams, these owners, they want more and more money for their games. So part of the backdrop for this uh, is the skyrocketing price uh, that's being charged by leagues like the NBA for rights to televise games. And, and honestly, that's the, the biggest challenge here to the business. How do, do, do these networks keep funding these huge bills to, play, to air these games? Brian, quickly, before we let you go, we've kind of seen these two things happen. First, streaming services struggle to find profitability, and then also this kind of streaming fatigue where people are sick of signing up for so many services. Do you think this is the beginning of sort of starting to see consolidation of rivals coming together? We only have a couple seconds, but just wondering your take on that. Everything old is new again. Everything new is old again. Yes, the rebundling is happening because the market's going to solve what are seen as failures, right? If things are too complicated, the market can solve that with this consolidation. Mm. Brian Stelter, always great to have you join us. Thanks so much. Thanks. Coming up, place your bets. The Super Bowl now just four days away. Millions of people are betting big ahead of the big game. And we're not just talking about the score or the commercials. We will break it all down. That's next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. It's an understatement to say it is a big year for Usher. His new album is out Friday and Sunday. He's headlining the Super Bowl halftime show. And now he's announced a tour. Yeah. The Grammy winning singer <laughs> will visit 24 cities for his past, present, future tour. It kicks off August 20th in Washington, ending in October in Chicago. It has been a decade since his last tour. Pre-sale tickets go on sale today with general sales on Monday, I feel like folks might be in an usher mood Monday morning. Exactly. Yeah, we're going to get some, we're all going to get some of him on Sunday, but that's so exciting. I love usher. I'm a fan. I'd go see it. Thanks, Joe. Finally, this hour, Super Bowl Sunday will be a night to remember no matter who wins, but it will also be a historic night for gamblers with more Americans than ever expected to bet on the big game. NBC News contributing correspondent Kaylee Hartug dug into the wild questions fans are betting on and how Taylor Swift could be shaking it up. As the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs gear up for a highly anticipated Super Bowl rematch, many fans are also preparing for the big game. The only way they know how, by placing their bets in historic numbers. There's going to be a lot of betting on the Super Bowl this year, probably more legal bets than at any other time in history. It's beyond just something people do. It's beyond an activity. It's also a cultural pastime in a lot of ways. It's a social thing that people do together. Nearly 68 million Americans are expected to bet on Super Bowl 58, smashing the all-time record. They're projected to spend an eye-popping sum, $23 billion, up 44% from last year. And with the Super Bowl in Las Vegas this year, Sin City also expecting a marquee weekend. This isn't our first rodeo. It might be our first Super Bowl, but I'm going to tell you, you know, we, we have an A game in this town, and uh, we will bring it for uh, Super Bowl weekend. Sportsbooks in Nevada forecasted to break a two-year-old record for largest Super Bowl handle ever, driving the surge in Super Bowl betting, a nationwide move to legalize sports betting. A lot of people want to do this. They want to do it legally. Certainly a lot of states see benefits of legalizing it, that they could get tax revenue, and the operators want to offer it. In just the last six years, 38 states have passed laws allowing gambling on sports. If you have any on specific props or specific angles that you're looking at. But it's not just the outcome of the game fans will be wagering on. Sportsbooks also offer hundreds of proposition bets called props, letting fans guess everything from how long Reba McIntyre's national anthem will be to the outcome of the opening coin toss, even the color of Gatorade thrown on the winning coach. The props are more popular than ever. Uh, we'll, um, we'll probably see about 67, 68 percent of our handle will be on the propositions. 
Harsher's Super Bowl halftime show, also driving a lot of action. Bookmakers offering odds on which surprise guest might join him on stage. This girl is on fire! One has Alicia Keys as the favorite, with Post Malone and Ludacris close behind. Taylor is in the house. But the biggest action of all may be about this year's most famous NFL fan, Taylor Swift, the center of attention on the sidelines this season amid her whirlwind romance with Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. Most U.S.-based sports books can't offer bets surrounding the megastar, but books based abroad have put dozens on the table. Will she be at the game? How many times will she be shown on camera? And will Kelsey pop the question. One book has the odds of a proposal at just six to one. Is there going to be another ring besides the Super Bowl ring if you win this thing on Sunday? I'm focused on getting this ring. That's, uh, that's, that's all that my mind's focused on right now. A possible storybook ending to a season to remember. Our thanks to Kaylee Hartung for that report. And if you're curious, here's another one you can bet on right now. The front runner for the color Gatorade that will be tossed on the winning Super Bowl coach. Purple. Purple. I think it would be red. Yeah, with I know. all the red. Purple. Also, teams. that that's the grape one, right? Ugh. <laughs> oh, I would have. I don't think they're runner. drinking it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, that's gonna do it for this hour of morning news. Now, stay with us though, because the news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, landmark verdict. A Michigan jury finds the mother of a teenage school shooter guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. This makes Jennifer Crumbly the first parent in the U.S. to be convicted in connection with a mass shooting committed by their child. The father of one of the victims says the decision will reverberate throughout the nation. The cries have been heard, and it, I, I feel it. This verdict is going to echo throughout every household in the country. We'll have more on that groundbreaking verdict, including hearing from the jury for, for person and what it means for future cases. Also this morning, appeal denied. A court strikes down former President Trump's claim of presidential immunity in his federal election interference case. The ruling comes as the Supreme Court prepares to hear arguments over whether Trump can remain on the ballot in Colorado. We'll have all the details on his mounting legal battles. Secretary Blinken is meeting with Israeli leaders in a bid to push through a truce in Gaza as Hamas submits a counterproposal for a ceasefire. The talks come as the UN warns of a large scale loss of civilian lives if Israel intensifies its assault in southern Gaza. We're going to have the latest out of the Middle East. Plus, is it time to ditch fast food? More and more consumers are turning their backs on fast food chains. What's behind the burger backlash and what restaurants are doing to try and bring customers back? We've seen some offering larger portions yes. and bigger food. True. I don't yep. know if that's going to do it. And you are welcome for the very early morning burger pictures. <laughs> so, no, that's that's what we're here for. About. Get to that in a second. We are, of course, going to begin with that verdict out of Michigan. Jennifer Crumbly, the mother of a school shooter, was convicted on four counts of manslaughter in connection to her son's deadly rampage. Legal experts predict yesterday's verdict will have a far-reaching effect on future cases like this. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us from the courthouse in Pontiac, Michigan, with the latest. This entire case taking exactly two weeks with those jurors, most of them parents, many of them gun owners, arriving at a verdict after less than two days of deliberations. Inside that courthouse, victims' families telling me they hope this serves as a wake-up call for parents across America. We find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Jennifer Crumbly, silent and stoic as the jury announced her fate. Guilty on all four charges, one for each student her son Ethan killed in the 2021 Oxford High School shooting. As she was led away in handcuffs, prosecutors embracing the families of her son's victims. Steve St. Juliana lost his 14-year-old daughter, Hannah. It's a bit of a wake-up call for, uh, for people to realize that they have to take a bit of responsibility. Crumbly is America's first parent to ever stand trial for their child's mass school shooting. My son has ruined his life. The defense arguing in court she was unaware of any mental health issues with her son. I've asked myself if I would have done anything differently and I wouldn't know. But prosecutors painted a very different picture, portraying Crumbly as a negligent parent who ignored warning signs in Ethan. He literally drew a picture of what he was going to do. 
he drew a picture. It says, help me. And instead of getting Ethan help, prosecutors argued his parents bought him a gun, showing this video of Crumbly at a shooting range with him just days before the massacre. Experts say their verdict could profoundly impact how authorities prosecute these cases. Does this open the door for parents to be held accountable for mass shootings, school shootings in the future? It absolutely does. Police officers will start looking at the parents and the way they deal with their children. Craig Schilling, who lost his 17-year-old son, Justin, hopes it will help prevent future tragedies. Can't just continue living life um, with the uncertainty of whether or not our kids are going to come home from school. Jennifer Crumbly's sentencing is set for April 9th. She faces a maximum penalty of 15 years in prison per charge. At the same time, her husband, James Crumbly's trial, is set to begin next month, and he faces the same charges, four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Back to you. All right, Maggie, thank you so much. We're going to take a closer look at this conviction, how the jury reached the verdict. Alex, the jury foreperson, joins us now. Thank you for being here with us. We're not using your last name to protect your privacy. As we mentioned, this is history, and there was no precedent before this for you to even refer to. So help us understand how you came to this decision. What was the key thing you heard in this case that made you say this needs to be a guilty verdict? I can't speak for my fellow jurors, mm -hmm. but I can say for me... Um, the video in the picture of her handling the gun very last um, was pretty damning for me. Um, I just think that she took the responsibility at that point, and at that point, the responsibility was on her to secure the weapon. As our colleague Maggie had just pointed out, this took less than two days for deliberation, but how difficult was it to come to a unanimous decision in that room? Was there debate there? There was um, pretty significant debate. Um, we started off with a good percentage of uh, not guilty and um, Fellow jurors made their case, and we arrived at our decision. What do you think was it that swayed the jurors who were initially leaning toward not guilty? There was a closer look at the evidence um, we were provided, and that that pushed a lot of the narrative forward. Um, and then being able to talk about, being able to talk to um, some of the responsible gun owners in the jury um, who advocated for the guilty verdict, um, and learning about safe storage and learning about what might be common sense for gun owners um, is really something that, that swayed me. How big a piece of it was just that? Was the handling of the gun versus some of those other things we saw, like the journal entries and things where it seemed as though Ethan had maybe expressed that he was having issues or needed help? How did you weigh those two things, the mental health concerns with the actual access to the gun? Um, it was definitely um, both very prevalent. Um, I just think that... Um, the access to the gun, for me, was the convincing factor. Um, I, I am upset that an appointment wasn't made for a mental health professional on the 30th. Um, and I, I just wish that um, people take mental health more seriously. Do you think this is going to send a message to other parents out there who are looking at this case and seeing that a parent can be held responsible for something like this and might make them say, yeah, I, I, I do need to take a closer look at some of these concerns I'm having. So I'm not concerned with the precedent that this sends, um, the message that it sends, the precedent that it sets. I'm just hopeful that this never happens again. Hmm. Would it have changed anything, do you think, had you heard from Ethan himself that was on the table at one point? What kind of impact do you think that could have had? It's hard to say. Um, some of the evidence um, was pretty alarming if and there's no telling what he could have said or what could have been done um, and so it's just too hypothetical you did hear from Jennifer Crumbly she made the decision to testify in her own defense what were your impressions of her did she say anything that helped or hurt her defense um, I think that when she said I wouldn't have done anything different um, some bells were going off for some jurors mm. If you don't mind me asking something, you know, more about the position that you were in. Yeah. Of course, having volunteered to be the fourth person, I also understand that the summons was in the mail right when you came home from your honeymoon. Yes. And then, you know, you report for jury duty and end up in a situation like this. What was this experience like for you? Was it intimidating at all? Um, it was very heavy. Um, it wasn't something that you couldn't take seriously. Um, and I just took it as an opportunity um, for myself to grow in, in leadership skills and taking 
charge of, you know, helping people conversate. No, it was like a New Year's resolution for you to try it and, was. right? That was my New Year's resolution. I was going to gain leadership skills, and so I found myself in a pretty funky position to Definitely. do so. What a way to do it, yeah. <laughs> ne next up is Jennifer Crumbly's husband, James, and part of her defense is really trying to point the finger at him. Do you, you can't make any predictions of what's going to happen here, but do you expect that case is going to be similar to this one? Without reviewing the evidence, I'm, I'm not really able to say. Um, I can say that the finger pointing is pretty severe in this case. Mm. Mm. Alex, we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. And congratulations on your recent yes. wedding. <laughs> All right, now to Washington, where a federal appeals court has rejected former President Trump's claim of immunity in the federal election interference case. The court ruled Trump can stand trial for his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election that led to the events of January 6th. The Trump team says it's planning to appeal the ruling. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett joins us here with more on the ruling and what comes next. Hey, Laura, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Of all of Donald Trump's legal problems, this case in Washington, D.C. is perhaps the most serious in terms of all of the things that he faces. Now, it's been caught up in court battles for months, but now those court battles could soon be resolved as the Court of Appeals has given him very little wiggle room on where he can go next. This morning, a major legal blow for Donald Trump, a federal appeals court giving the Justice Department the green light to prosecute the former president for his efforts to reverse the 2020 election. We will never give up. We will never concede. The three-judge panel referring to the former president as Citizen Trump, unanimously rejecting the argument that he should be immune from charges related to the acts he took while still in office. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes calling Mr. Trump's alleged efforts to remain in power despite losing the 2020 election, if proven, an unprecedented assault on the structure of our government. Adding, we cannot accept former President Trump's claim that a president has unbounded authority to commit crimes that would neutralize the most fundamental check on executive power, the recognition and implementation of election results. Mr. Trump arguing his case on Truth Social, as he has for weeks, saying in part without complete immunity, a president of the United States would not be able to properly function. The Trump campaign pouncing on the decision as a political fundraising opportunity, and the former president continuing his domination over the Republican Party with another victory overnight. Trump was not even on the ballot in the Nevada primary, running in a separate caucus instead, but Nikki Haley still came in second place, with more people choosing to vote for, quote, none of these candidates instead, according to NBC News projections. A rejection of Mr. Trump's only remaining Republican opponent as he fights more legal battles ahead. So, Laura, the court has not given much time for this potential appeal here. What should we know about that? Yeah, the Court of Appeals has really tied the former president's hands in terms of what he can do strategically to go next. So what to, what's going to come literally soon is on Monday, he has to go to the Supreme Court to ask for this decision to be paused. Because mm. if it's not paused, then it's game on with the trial. And the trial could probably start sometime this summer at the very earliest. Because remember, guys, while there have been all of these legal wranglings and delays, he's going to get the benefit of all of this time and he's gonna be able to tack that on so whenever the supreme court rules you have to imagine at least 60 days added on to that all right laura thank you and actually we're gonna keep you and kind of switch gears here and talk about another big story this morning that also does actually involve former president trump that's his efforts to remain on the ballot in the state of colorado the supreme court is set to hear arguments thursday on that question it was back in december when the colorado supreme court disqualified mr trump from the primary ballot the case concerns whether he engaged in insurrection on january 6th under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. So, Laura, talk us through how we got to this point and what to expect out of the Supreme Court tomorrow. So there had been a wave of lawsuits to try to get the former president kicked off the ballot, but it wasn't until Colorado's highest court, the Supreme Court in that state, actually did something that no other court had done. Mm. and said he should be removed from the ballot. But they recognized that what they were doing was a pretty big deal. So they said, you too can go to the Supreme Court on this issue. And of course, that's what he's done. And so everything has been sort of frozen in time. Mm. But remember, Colorado is up, like many other states, on Super Tuesday.
So we could be seeing a decision on this relatively quickly. That is coming quickly. Yeah. Trump's mm -hmm. legal team filed a brief a few weeks ago outlining why they feel the Colorado decision right. was wrong. What's their main argument here? So I don't know when the last time you read the 14th Amendment is, but it's <laughs> not exactly a model of clarity. And there are about 10 different ways he's tried to attack this. To try, essentially said, I'm not even covered by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment because it doesn't actually list mm -hmm. the president as someone who would be banned from office. Now, there's a lot of arguments back and forth about whether he's covered by something else as an officer of the United States, but it's not clear that that's ever been determined. And he would, of course, argue, I didn't engage in an insurrection. I told everyone to go home. I didn't do anything that would count as an insurrection. So there have been a lot of arguments back and forth on w whether he actually even qualifies to fall under this. So two quick questions here. How soon could we hear on this? But then also, yeah. if Colorado wins, what's that mean? What are the ramifications So of the Supreme Court doesn't have any timeline. They can come back whenever they want. They can sit on this for as long as they want. But they know that if they don't decide this soon, it's going to come up again because there's all of these other mm -hmm. lawsuits waiting in the wings. So I think we'll hear back at least before Super Tuesday. Mm. If Colorado wins, that doesn't mean he's automatically kicked off the ballot everywhere. It would still have to go back then to the states to go through the normal mm. adjudication. And you can imagine, plenty of states are not going to kick him off the ballot. So we'd have to see which states actually want to go that far. All right. Laura Jarrett, thank yeah. you. Covering it all for us. <laughs> you could have covered the whole show so far. Thanks. Exactly. Appreciate it. Turning now to the Middle East, there are doubts over a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas, with one Israeli official telling NBC News that Hamas's counterproposal is unrealistic. Those negotiations come as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken wraps up his tour of the region. Blinken met with Israeli officials earlier today to discuss the release of hostages, as well as more aid getting into Gaza. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is in Tel Aviv with all the latest on this. Matt, good morning. So what are we learning about Secretary Blinken's meeting with Israeli leaders? What's the U.S. hoping to walk away with here on, on this, his fifth visit to the area? Yeah, I mean, we haven't really heard much yet from that meeting, and we're waiting to hear more. This is going to be very consequential, as you mentioned, the fifth meeting. He's talking a lot about that hostage negotiation deal that, as you mentioned, there's a lot of pessimism now about that because Hamas has come back with their own counterproposal. Israel, Israelis have said it's looking unrealistic given the kind of maximalist demands we've been hearing from the Palestinians. But that's only one part of Antony Blinken's mission here. Another thing he's trying to do is to tamp down concerns that the war could be spreading beyond the Gaza Strip and beyond Israel into the wider region. This, as we're seeing the U.S. pummeling targets of Iran-backed militant groups in Iraq and Syria and in Yemen, the Houthis, who have been striking and harassing international shipping for the past several months in the Gulf of Aden and in the Red Sea. And then there's another thing that he's going to be trying to do. He's looking even further to a very ambitious proposal that the Biden administration has come up with to eventually see America recognize a Palestinian state, the two-state solution that you keep hearing about. This is something that has eluded so many past presidents, and it's going to involve a lot of moving parts, a lot of assurances from Saudi Arabia, who would then be recognizing Israel and starting their own uh, normalized diplomatic relationships with Israel. And it would mean kind of revitalizing the moribund Palestinian Authority, which doesn't have control over the Gaza Strip, doesn't really have that much control over the West Bank, the other occupied territory uh, that belongs to the Palestinians and that the Israelis now control quite a bit of. So this is another a part of that three-pronged effort uh, that Blinken is engaged in here in the Middle East. Guys. Matt, meanwhile, let's talk about the fighting on the ground in Gaza. It's intensifying the Hamas-run Ministry of Health specifically says that the Israeli military is carrying out a siege on the Nasser Medical Complex. What do we know about those attacks? Yeah, the Nasser Medical Co Complex in Han Yunis. This has been a, a really bad situation. We've been seeing... Uh, what looks like thousands of patients evacuated from the Al Nasser Medical Complex. Uh, a lot of them are going to have to head to Rafah. That's a, a town that's on the southern edge of the Gaza Strip, right along the border with Egypt. And that is a city that is about to be pummeled by the Israelis as well, even though it contains more than a million displaced people from elsewhere in the Gaza Strip. So this is kind of approaching an endgame here. Now, we had seen the heartbreaking scenes of last week where we saw people celebrating in the streets of Rafa that they thought they might be about to see some kind of ceasefire that would end Israel's incursion into the Gaza Strip. And as we know now, that ceasefire has not come, and it may never come, considering that there is no agreement from either side. Guys. Also, Matt, you, you mentioned the Houthi rebels. They vowed to increase attacks on U.S. and U.K. ships in the Red Sea if the war in Gaza doesn't stop. How is the U.S. responding to that? 
Well, I mean, we're going to be continuing to see those attacks by the U.S. pummeling Houthi targets. And this is something that we've been seeing quite a bit of. Even before those three U.S. servicemen were killed in Jordan by those Iranian-backed groups. Now, the U.S. and the U.K. have specified, they made it very clear, the attacks that they're launching against the Houthis in Yemen have nothing to do with their attacks against these Iranian-backed groups in Iraq and Syria. They're not even necessarily wrapped up uh, with the international uh, international community that has come together, a coalition to try to uh, defend international shipping in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. So we can expect that those attacks are going to continue on both sides. Guys. All right. Matt Bradley, Matt, thank you. Well, during a busy day on Capitol Hill, the House of Representatives voted against impeaching Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas after a months-long effort from Republicans. Meanwhile, Republicans in the Senate are set to kill that bipartisan border security package just two days after they finished negotiating it with Democrats. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now with the latest on all this Capitol Hill news. Hey, Ryan, good morning. Hey, Savannah, and it is safe to say that this did not turn out the way Republicans had planned. They had hoped to use the impeachment of Alejandro Mayorkas as a way to put the crisis at the border front and center. Instead, the vote failed, leaving Speaker Mike Johnson struggling to find a path forward. A stunning development on Capitol Hill and a day of chaos for House Republicans. The resolution is not adopted. Who were hoping to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Holding on to a razor-thin majority, there were a few Republican defections, but they still thought they had enough votes. That was until Democrat Al Green, recovering from surgery, made a surprise appearance, providing Democrats an extra vote, enough to kill the measure. Yeah, they may have been caught a little bit off guard. And moments later, Speaker Mike Johnson also failing to marshal enough support for another big Republican push, an Israel military assistance bill. The GOP already vowing to bring the Mayorkas impeachment articles up for a vote again soon. A spokesperson for DHS calling on Republicans to, quote, abandon these political games and instead support the bipartisan national security agreement in the Senate. That bill, designed in part to confront the growing crisis at the southern border, is stalled. A frustrated President Biden placing the blame on Donald Trump. He wants a political issue to run against me. But Republicans who begged for changes at the border now arguing this package would make the situation worse. This does more harm than good. The result is the best and only hope of any type of border reform is effectively dead. While the crisis at the border continues to grow with no solution in sight. And there are new developments this morning with that full national security package. They will have a procedural vote on it later today. It's expected to fail. But this morning, sources are telling us that Majority Leader Chuck Schumer plans to remove the border piece of that legislation with the goal of pushing through aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. The first vote on that new package could happen as soon as this afternoon. Savannah? All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you. Time now for weather. Possibly we'll see record high temps for parts of the country today. Angie Lassman joins us with the latest on that. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. The calendar might read February, but it's feeling like April for a lot of the country. We've got another batch of potential record highs that we could see later this afternoon. Quick look at those afternoon temperatures. And we've got 60s in places like Kansas City and Des Moines. Des Moines, by the way, running 30 degrees above normal for this time of year. Minneapolis will be close to 60, 64 degrees in Little Rock. And you can see it extends out east, too, for places like Cincinnati and Cleveland will be well into the 50s. And it's not just today. It's tomorrow, too. We'll see these temperatures staying milder than normal for uh, folks in Indianapolis into the upper 50s. We've got 62 on tap for St. Louis. Tulsa hits 71 for your day tomorrow. And Detroit will be 20 degrees or more above normal for this time of year with a temperature of 55 degrees. And we stay like that here really as we get into the end of the work week and into the weekend. Some spots will see their warmest temperature, places like Chicago on Friday at 57 degrees and then get back down into the 30s by Sunday. But look at New York. We're into the 50s on Friday. We head to the upper 50s by Saturday and then we kind of moderate back into those mid 50s for Sunday. We've got 60s and mid 60s for folks in Nashville. So it's going to be a couple of days of feeling quite warm. Raleigh will be close to 70 degrees in February for parts of the weekend. And it's not just this kind of batch of a couple of days that we've been seeing these warmer than normal temperatures for a lot of 
of the country. When we take a big picture look so far uh, across the country, notice where you see all those oranges and reds. That's temperatures that are running warmer than normal for the winter so far, and it is expanding across a lot of the country. We still have a little time to go in winter, but notice where you see those red dots. We've got warmest winter on record so far in places like Medford, Stockton, Fresno, where you see the yellow. We're talking already into the top three of the warmest winters, so still have a chance that we could get into that top spot in some of those spots. Places like Flint, Grand Rapids, Madison, La Crosse, all included in that. But look how many folks across the Northeast are dealing with their top three warmest winters so far. Newark, Williamsport, we've got Youngstown, and then where you see the red, of course, places like Minneapolis, we know we've been warmer than normal. We've got 5 to 15 degrees above average for a lot of this winter, and this is likely going to continue here uh, for the next couple of weeks. We only have a little while left in winter, so it's been kind of a dud for folks out east. Meanwhile, out west, it's been busy a couple of days, right? We've still got a couple of rounds of rain that we're going to watch here work on shore. I know folks are hoping for those drier skies. We really don't see that settle in uh, until we get to the weekend. So here's a couple of those showers that we're tracking right now. We'll be watching for uh, uh, some of these kind of periods of drier skies and then another batch of the rain that works through for Southern California here as we get into the evening hours and into tomorrow. We'll also add on some additional snow across many of those western mountain ranges. And meanwhile, as we get into your Thursday, that system works even farther east, bringing a little bit of a kind of soggy forecast to our friends across the Great Lakes and the northern plains. We'll see some snow. That, of course, will always cause some uh, issues when it comes to travel. The good news is most of the heaviest of the rain is out of the picture, but we'll still add on maybe up to an inch in some spots across Southern California. We've seen the images coming out of that location. So, of course, they're hoping uh, for some dry skies to clean up. But, guys, it looks like we'll, we'll have to wait uh, until really we get into your Saturday forecast uh, for, for them to see some completely dry conditions there. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the snow, a foot to a foot and a half. So ski resorts will be happy. But, of course, I, as, as we always say, the travel will be difficult, especially if you add the wind in there. So, uh, you know, tale of two sides of the country, right? We've got really, really warm spring-like temperatures, and then we've got snow falling across the mountains. I can't believe how warm it's going to get this weekend in New York. But what are you going to do? If, February. It, party outside. Picnic. <laughs> rose yeah, my theory is if it's, if it's yes, not, not going to snow, on the roof. if it's not going to snow, bring on the warmth. No, I'm, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of like, I don't need, you know, 30 I get, degrees I, I whatever, get that. Yeah. So. All right. <laughs> Andrew, thank you. No problem. Coming up, royal reunion, at least partly. And Prince Harry visiting his father following King Charles' diagnosis, but a source telling NBC News a meeting with his brother, William, not in the cards. We'll tell you the latest on that up next. We're back with a major development in the investigation into that door plug blowout on an Alaska Airlines flight last month. This morning, the NTSB says it has photographic evidence that the door plug was not properly bolted in place when it left the Boeing factory. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has more. The NTSB says this photo shows the failed Alaska Airlines door plug still on the Boeing production line without at least three of the four bolts to hold it in place. That door plug blew out two months after Alaska received the plane. Preliminary NTSB report says workers at the Boeing plant removed the plug after it arrived from Spirit Aerosystems with damaged rivets. But once it was reinstalled, those bolts were missing. Last month, Alaska CEO Ben Minicucci showed us where the door plugs were supposed to be. These are the missing bolts, potential missing bolts. Yeah, these are the ones that would be the highest critical bolts that would be missing. These ones right here. Make no mistake, this was... A close call, too close. On Capitol Hill, the FAA chief said Boeing quality control had clearly failed. If you don't have that safety culture, I think it's hard to make safe airplanes. And the FAA doesn't have enough inspectors inside Boeing to oversee production. It may now use a third party for inspections rather than Boeing's self-inspections. I think we're going to need more boots on the ground. We're going to need more inspectors. Boeing said it's accountable for what happened. An event like this must not happen on an airplane that leaves our factory. Boeing is taking immediate action to strengthen quality. The FAA chief was asked, would he fly on a MAX? He says if it's certified, it's safe. 
Back to you. All right, Tom Costello, thank you. Now to London and the latest developments following the news that King Charles is being treated for cancer. Britain's prime minister revealed yesterday that the king's cancer was caught early. Prince Harry has returned to the UK to see his father as Prince William prepares to take on some of the king's public duties. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us now from Buckingham Palace with the latest. Molly, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. Lots of interest on this family. We did just see Prince William return to public duties for the first time since Kate, Princess of Wales, was released from the hospital last week. And as you mentioned, we know that Prince Harry flew over to the UK. A palace source, though, tells NBC News there are no plans for the brothers to meet up. This morning, Prince William is back in the public eye, performing an investiture ceremony at Windsor Castle, a sign of things to come. The heir to the throne stepping up, even as his wife, the Princess of Wales, recuperates from her own health scare back at home. This comes the morning after Prince Harry landed back in the UK, heading straight from Heathrow Airport to his father at Clarence House. It's the first time he will have seen his father in any meaningful way really since the Queen's funeral. He was here for the coronation, but we know he didn't really see his father. But a palace source tells NBC News brothers William and Harry have no plans to meet up while Harry's in town. Well-wishers reacting to the news of Harry's arrival. The son should come and see his dad when there's trouble. His dad needs him right now. It just seems really sad. Hopefully it might and heal some of the family rifts. They might all pull together around that, hopefully. This sort of thing can, can pull people together, can't it? And King Charles appearing for the first time since the diagnosis was announced. He and Queen Camilla traveling the short distance from their home to Buckingham Palace, then by helicopter to their country estate Sandringham to recover out of the public eye. The palace maintains that while supporting her husband, Queen Camilla will keep up a full schedule. The woman once seen as an outsider now playing a crucial role. And while he takes it easy, the king plans to continue his state duties, taking meetings in private, at least for now. What's interesting and notable is that the councillors of state, the people who stand in for the king if he can't do any of that, Prince William, the Queen, Princess Anne, Prince Edward, they are not being called on at the moment to step in for him. Still, all eyes on the King's eldest son as he takes on more responsibility than ever before. More responsibility than ever before and a busy first day back in the limelight for Prince William. He has another event later tonight and he is expected to say a few words. Joe, we will be watching and listening closely, of course, high interest if he says anything about his father. Joe. All right, Molly, thank you so much. Coming up, we will hear from Lester Holt's exclusive interview with Iran's ambassador to the U.N. What the ambassador has to say about the ongoing hostilities between U.S. forces and Iran-backed militias in the Middle East. That's next. Welcome back. Iranian-backed Houthi militia launched more attacks on ships in the Red Sea. As the U.S. retaliates with waves of airstrikes, there's a chilling warning from Iran's ambassador to the United Nations. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt sat down for an exclusive interview with the ambassador to talk about the potential for escalating violence. Do you think the risk of war is growing? Yeah. I spoke to Ambassador Amir Saeed Iravani just days after three U.S. soldiers died in a drone attack. And with ongoing strikes on commercial ships in the Red Sea, the U.S. blaming Iranian-backed militias. Much of the conversation centers on the level of control or influence that you and the Iranian mm. government has over these groups, the Houthis mm. and other groups. If you pick up the phone, mm. can you end the attacks? No. May I say that it is not the same case. The relation between Iran and the resistance group in this region may be compared with the NATO treaty. So you're calling this like a, a defense pact? Yeah, defense pact between the resistance group and Iran. They have their own decision. They have their own choices. It is not related to a phone call to the Houthis. Houthi attacks that we've seen on commercial shipping, mm. um, sophisticated weapons. Is Iran supplying those weapons? Not at all. Would Iran prefer that the Houthi attacks against commercial shipping, uh, threatening U.S. Uh, uh, naval vessels, do you wish those would stop? Are they helpful? Yeah, we encourage all of them should stop. You're encouraging them to stop? We encourage them for a stop. We expect that the other side also should encourage the Israeli to stop.
On Friday, the U.S. began what's expected to be a wave of attacks in response to the deaths of those American soldiers. If there is an American attack on Iran or Iranian interests, what do you foresee the reaction would be? Absolutely, you know, we have their own reaction. We said clearly that if they attack in Iran soil or Iran benefit or Iran individuals all around the world, we have their own reaction. We will defend absolutely. And I asked about news Hamas has responded to an offer for a hostage deal. There's been a response from the opposition, but um, it, uh, yes, I'm sorry, from Hamas, but it seems to be uh, a little over the top. We're not sure where it is. How do you view the, the, the fact that a deal may come about soon? I think that if the other side accept the condition of the Hamas, the ceasefire is possible. A lasting one? Lasting one. Our thanks to Lester Holt for that interview. Now to what's making international headlines. A pair of bombings has killed dozens of people in Pakistan. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. That's right. Officials in Pakistan confirmed that at least 26 people were killed and dozens more were injured in two separate bombings uh, in just a day before parliamentary elections are expected to be held all across uh, the country. Now, one of the attacks targeted the election office of a candidate for the Ulema Islam Party, a leading radical Islamist party known for backing the Afghan Taliban. Now, the other bombing took place at another election office in the same province. No one immediately claimed responsibility for the attacks. Let's now go off the coast of the Japanese island of Hokkaido, where a pod of killer whales trapped in drift ice are believed to have safely escaped. The orcas were initially spotted by a local fisherman on Tuesday morning, and later on officials confirmed about a dozen of them were trapped in a tiny gap surrounded by drift ice about a mile offshore. When they returned this morning, they were gone. Well, they say they believe the killer whales were able to free themselves as gaps grew between them and the drift ice. And let's come back here in Rome, where Tuesday authorities unveiled a replica of a giant 42 feet high statue of Emperor Constantine, the fourth century ruler of the Roman Empire. A few surviving portions of the original marble statue, including two giant feet, a knee, a bicep, and an enormous head, have been on display in Rome's Capitoline Hill museums for centuries. But now experts used 3D modeling technology from scans of the original body parts to reconstruct the whole thing. Now, the work has been financed by the Fondazione Prada, the cultural arm of the Italian fashion house. Perhaps they were inspired by the uh, gilded tunic that is wrapped around the body of that statue. Back to you guys. Seeing it on runways all across the world. Gosh, oh it's God. so huge, like, like the people for scale. <laughs> it's amazing. Thanks, Claudia. I appreciate it. Well, coming up, leaving a bitter taste. Well, some people are walking out of fast food chains over price hikes and what the restaurants are doing to try and bring them back. Next. An eight-year-old girl in Wisconsin became an unlikely hero after she was trapped in the backseat of a car during a terrifying carjacking. This comes as carjackings are on the rise across the country. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett has that story. A routine stop at a Wisconsin quick trip turning into a nightmare. Someone just stole my car on 27th Street with my two kids in the car. But an eight-year-old girl's quick thinking. I was scared. I was like, what's happening? Saving her and her sister after a shocking carjacking. I was really just about an arm's length away from my car. Adam Jorgensen says he went to grab a cloth to dry off his vehicle after a car wash when someone asked him for directions. Then suddenly... I heard the screeching of our tires. The car was gone with his daughters, two-year-old Autumn and eight-year-old Charlie, in the back seat. He told me to get out of the car. I was like, oh, what should I do? Should I run and be a scary cat or should I save my sister too? Charlie telling our affiliate WTMJ she knew her dad had the keys, not the carjackers, and she decided to stay put. The driver ditched the car and the kids at the Batteries Plus store about a mile down the road. And Charlie acted fast, her little sister panicking. grabbing her dad's phone from the front of the car and calling her mom, leaving this message. Mom, I need you. We love dad. 
Their dad back at Quick Trip frantically on the phone with police. We are over by Batteries Plus, and then an officer's going to come over and meet you at the Quick Trip, okay? All right, but you guys have my kids. The incident reflecting a bigger trend in carjackings, rising 17% from 2022 to 2023 in nearby Milwaukee. And nationally, carjackings up 93% from 2019 to 2023, according to a new Council on Criminal Justice report tracking rates across 10 U.S. cities. Back in Oak Creek, the police department said it took three suspects into custody and it's seeking felony charges this week. Now, a family reunited. I ran as fast as I could out of the back of that cop car to hug them. Hoping others will learn how quickly things can go wrong. Remember you won't bother drying your car? <laughs> uh, yes, we'll dry the car at home now as well. Yeah. Oh. Thanks to Maura Barrett for that report. The Oak Creek police say that thanks to the father's calm and collected 911 call, officers had everything they needed to find and arrest those three suspects within 48 hours. Amazing story. Well, time for some financial headlines now. There's major news in the growing world of streaming sports. CNBC's Bertha Coombs has that and other money news. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Man, the landscape just keeps shifting when it comes to sports. ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery are, dis are launching a sports streaming service this fall that will include offerings from at least 15 networks and all four major sports, uh, professional sports leagues. A uh, name and pricing still to be announced, but it will include games from the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NHL, WNBA, NASCAR, and college sports, as well as golf, tennis, and the FIFA World Cup. Subscribers will have the ability to bundle the product with Disney Plus and HBO Max. The announcement comes as ESPN is preparing to enter talks to renew its NBA rights, which expire at the end of the season. Notably, doesn't include CBS, doesn't include NBC, doesn't include Amazon or, or Apple, which are also getting into streaming. This is getting more and more competitive every day. Meantime, Ford is rethinking its electric vehicle plants. CEO Jim Farley says the company still believes the market will grow, but widespread adoption by consumers won't happen until costs are more in line with traditional vehicles. Ford previously confirmed plans to delay or cut about $12 billion in spending on all electric vehicles. And Amazon may soon show you the name and photo of the person delivering your package, all in the name of safety. The information reports that this is part of a test aimed at protecting the company's flex delivery drivers. Amazon may also provide those drivers with Amazon branded stickers and lights to put on their cars since they often use their own vehicles. The move is likely in response to a report last year saying flex drivers have been threatened after being mistaken for intruders. So hopefully this will be safe for both the people getting the packages and the people delivering. Absolutely. All right, Bertha, thank you so much. Inflation might be slowing down, but it's still on the menu at fast food restaurants with some chains under fire for rising prices. Now, because of that backlash, CEOs at companies like McDonald's say they are focusing on affordability this year. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans joins us now with more on this. Christine, good morning. Good morning. Inflation has come for your fast food menu, guys. And frankly, consumers are fed up. Some companies have become more creative with their menus and customers have become much more price sensitive and they're hearing these complaints. Once upon a time, a few dollars could purchase a quick meal at a fast food restaurant. I think people should be able to eat good food without spending much money. But these days, grabbing a burger and fries takes a much bigger bite out of your wallet. Why are we not talking about these fast food restaurants going up to? Almost $9 for a Big Mac. Once home to the dollar menu, prices at the Golden Arches leaving a bad taste in the mouth of consumers who just want value. Going viral, the Big Mac meal priced at $18 at a Connecticut rest stop and an Egg McMuffin selling for more than $7. Fast food companies are listening. McDonald's CEO says he's focusing on affordability this year. Two McChicken and a medium Sprite for only $3. Telling analysts that customers making $45,000 a year and less are ditching their Mickey D's and buying groceries instead. You can see why. The price of food at home rose just 1.3% over the past year, but food away from home jumped more than 5%. They're here. McDonald's best burgers ever. 
Brands like McDonald's rolling out upgrades to its famous burgers and hoping its new Cosmics franchise will help bring customers back. I think one way consumers can kind of really find themselves going back in the door of some of these QSR fast food restaurants is finding out what brought them there to begin with. McDonald's did this last year. They started to bring nostalgia back. Taco Bell was like the one place where you could actually stretch that money. And Taco Bell expanding its value menu to 10 items under three bucks. The company remains dedicated to offering our fans delicious food at affordable prices. At Chipotle, sales and foot traffic rose in the quarter, despite that 3% hike in menu prices in October. It all means finding the best deal will require a little bit of planning. Most menus these days do have something that's considered a value menu or value option, but you do probably benefit more from doing your research ahead of time. And some now are offering value meals that are like family size value meals. So you can check to see what might be the best deal. McDonald's, by the way, telling NBC News that pricing is typically up to franchisees. And that's why it varies by restaurant. Uh, and McDonald's says that it always strives to strike the right balance of value for money with their customers. We reached out to Chipotle for comment and did not hear uh, back. But it's so interesting to me, you guys, that the way those grocery prices are now barely moving and some categories like cereal and bread are falling but fast food prices have been rising, and that CEO of McDonald's on his earnings call saying they have noticed that some people are choosing groceries instead of McDonald's, mm. and they hear them. Uh, are there some tips to try and save money if you're going to go out to fast food restaurants? Yeah, look to see if they have those value packs, if they have bundling of bigger size meals, right? There's also apps that you can use for the latest deals and to accumulate points. And then experts say this, you can order a kid's meal. If you don't have a big appetite, I guess, you can get a kid's meal, and that usually is a little bit cheaper. You know, I'm going to tell you, my philosophy is if I'm going to splurge on fast food, and in my family, fast food is a splurge, if I'm going to splurge on fast food, I want the whole thing. I don't want a kid's <laughs> meal. I want the whole yeah. thing. I, I you want, want that Big pounder, Mac with the four patties or whatever. pounder with cheese. I want the whole thing. <laughs> Definitely doing a combo, yeah. All right. All right. Ugh, and now all I want is a burger. <laughs> You're welcome. Christine, yeah. thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, Mama Knows Best. Yeah, we're going to hear from the mother of Travis Kelsey as she prepares to head to Las Vegas to cheer on her son at the Super Bowl. But will Taylor Swift be at her side? That interview with our friends over at Today is coming right up. Welcome back. Trailblazing Olympic gold medalist Gabby Douglas is returning to competitive gymnastics and she's got her sights set on this summer's Paris Olympics. Douglas made the announcement right here on NBC News Now telling Hallie Jackson she missed competing. Douglas, of course, was the first black gymnast to win the Olympic all-around gold medal back in London in 2012. Four years later, she stepped away from gymnastics to work on her mental health. The 28-year-old will start her comeback later this month at the Winter Cup in Louisville where she'll be the oldest gymnast competing at, again, just 28. <laughs> so that's not to say she is old, but, you know, it's a young sport. That would be an incredible story if she makes it to Paris. Sure we are now, speaking of sports, just four days away from Super Bowl 58 in Las Vegas, where the San Francisco 49ers will take on the defending champs, the Kansas City Chiefs. Getting a front row seat again to cheer on the Chiefs. Donna Kelsey, mother of star tight end Travis Kelsey. She spoke about the big game earlier this morning on Today. Here's part of that conversation. It is going to be a dream, um, you know, to go back to back like this, uh, back to the Super Bowl, and really excited. What, what kind of conversations do you have with Travis on game day? Do you give him a phone call? Do you give him a pep talk? Yeah. I try not to bother them on game day because they're a little busy and I don't think they're I'm going to get through. But um, <laughs> usually I I try like the night before I will text um, my sons mm -hmm. and uh, we'll you know, give them a little encouragement, send them a little funny picture of when they were younger, depending on what uh, team they're playing with or whatever. So I go back in a little nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Mama Kelsey, the, the last time you were here, um, you were mm -hmm. just sort of getting to know, shall we say, <laughs> Travis's girlfriend. Um, yes. But we noticed that recently you changed your Facebook photo, uh -huh. and, and now your Facebook photo uh, features uh, his girlfriend quite prominently. Uh -huh. how, how would you characterize your relationship with, with Taylor Swift these days? How's, how's that going? 
you know, really, that was a picture where all of us were so excited that we're, that we're in the suite, and we were so excited that they made it to the Super Bowl that we just took a shot of everybody that was there. So it wasn't anything, you know, like calculating or anything like that. It just was everybody that was supporting my son, and I was so happy um, to put that picture on Facebook, yes. How's the seating arrangement in the box? Are you in a chair? And it's usually you and Taylor are next to each other. I feel like that might be some good luck. Well, you can understand that the boxes in Vegas are multi-million dollars. Yeah. So I have a feeling I'm not in a box. I have a oh. feeling I'm in the stands. As far as I know, I'm in the stands with everybody else because it is a pricey Super Bowl. Mama Kelsey's up in the, in the rafters. I don't, I don't believe that. There's, there's some people with some money who will be around her cheering on I think it's. I think it's funny. A year ago, it was like, which of your sons are you cheering for? And now all the questions are about, you know, who her son's dating. Yeah, which I clearly know. she's not, so not, yeah. not wanting to answer all of them right now. When Taylor Swift's boyfriend is playing in the Super Bowl. <laughs> exactly. That is how it goes. Yeah. Good to always hear Just from a couple Mama days Kelsey. away now from exactly. that. Exactly. So. That. Thanks to our friends at the Today Show, by the way, for that conversation. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stick around, though. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.